Hello and welcome to worship with us here at Aberdeen St Stephen's Parish Church online. It's good to have you here. I'm Reverend Maggie White, Minister at St Stephen's. Let me begin today by wishing a very warm welcome to those of you who join us via our phone line. It's great to know that you're able to be with us. Let us know if there's anything we can do to help improve this way of accessing worship. I'm sure you must sometimes wonder who's of the disembodied voices taking part in leading our services. So let me just tell you, our scriptures will be read today by Susan Edwards Horton and myself. I hope you will experience for yourself that Jesus is present here in our online fellowship. If you're new to our weekly services and you would like to get in touch with us, You'll find our contact details on the screen at the end of the worship, or you'll find our phone number in the Yellow Pages phone directory. We've come together to worship God, so let's take a moment to prepare our hearts and our minds to that purpose. Our call to worship today is taken from Psalm 147, verses 1 to 11 and 20c. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God, how pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble, but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with grateful praise. Make music to our God on the harp. He covers the sky with clouds. He supplies the earth with rain, and he makes the grass grow on the hills. He provides food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they call. His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, nor his delight in the legs of the warrior. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. Praise the Lord. Well, let's sing those words of the psalm together in hymn number 103, Fill Your Hearts with Joy and Gladness.
let us pray. Almighty and all-powerful God, fill our hearts with joy and gladness now as we bow before you. You are our God. We are your people. We worship you. Your wisdom and love overwhelm us. Your majesty is awesome and your mercy unending. You have given us free will to praise you or not. Sadly, we sometimes let you down. When we turn from you, you are patient with our flaws. You do not turn your back on us. You guide us day by day and rescue us from sin in Christ Jesus. Parent God, Mother and Father of all that is, accept our gift of worship and by your Holy Spirit make it worthy of you. Reach out to us through your word. Inspire us to follow in your son's footsteps. To show love and compassion to all. To forgive those who offend us. To heal hurt where we can. Gracious God, teach us to be gracious too, that we may show to others the love we find in you. Hear us now, O God, as we pray in the words Jesus gave us our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Let's sing again hymn number 606, Lord, You Sometimes Speak in Wonders. Today's Old Testament reading comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 21 to 31. That is Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 21 to 31. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood? since the earth was founded. He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown 
no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, no one, not one of them, is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. The New Testament reading is in the first book of Corinthians, chapter 9, verses 16 to 23. That is 1 Corinthians, chapter 9, verses 16 to 23. Yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge and, not, and so not make use of my rights in preaching it. Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law I became like one not having the law, Though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, and that I may share in its blessings. This is the word of the Lord. We will now sing the hymn, Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength.
Today's Gospel reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 29 to 39. Mark, chapter 1, 29 to 39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand and helped her up. The fever left her and she began to wait on them. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who were ill and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak, because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let's go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so that I can preach there also. That's why I have come. So he travelled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Amen. May God add his blessing to these readings from his holy word. Let us pray. May the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You may remember that in our gospel reading last Sunday, we heard an account of Jesus healing a man who was possessed by an evil spirit. This description of the man's ailment may leave many of us uncomfortable. We don't really know what Mark meant by this phrase. 2,000 years on, we cannot determine from the brief information we are given just what ailed the man. We hear of this type of healing again in today's passage from Mark. We can only speculate as to the true nature of these illnesses. But perhaps it's enough to know that Jesus came upon people in distress and regardless of the cause, he reached out to help them. Whatever day of the week or time of day, Jesus used his healing power for the benefit of those who came to him. Our passage today is a continuation of last week's story. It's still the same day and Jesus and his companions have left the synagogue and returned to Simon and Andrew's home to eat. It was around midday on the Sabbath. No sooner had they arrived at the house than Jesus was told that Simon's mother-in-law had a fever. Again, with no hesitation, Jesus went to her, took her by the hand and she was well. The same authority that we saw when Jesus healed the man at the synagogue that morning is evident here again, and this time Jesus didn't even use words. Clearly, news of the morning's events had spread. This was the Sabbath, and so carrying any load would have been deemed to be work. Under the law of Moses, which the Pharisees strictly interpreted and applied, even to carry a sick person to Jesus would have been a violation of the Sabbath. However, as soon as the sun set and the Sabbath ended, those who had heard of the earlier healing came in droves to Simon and Andrew's home to seek Jesus. Now, instead of healing one individual, Jesus came out into the street and went from one to another, restoring people to wellness. Once again, we are told Jesus drove out demons, but unlike the scene at the synagogue earlier, when the when the spirit on leaving the man shouted out to Jesus and called him the Holy One of God. This time, Mark tells us that Jesus would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Although the opening of this gospel states the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the way in which Mark relates the story it's only at the end that many of the people who follow Jesus really seem to get to know who Jesus is. It's not only a theme of silence that persists. Those who know Jesus 
true identity are forbidden to speak of it. But there are those too who seem to take a long time to catch on, and others who only see the truth after the resurrection, and some not at all. Although the people of Israel had waited 4,000 years for the Messiah to come, many now failed to recognise him. The leaders of the community were amongst the greatest offenders. The Pharisees and scribes were the religious leaders. Their knowledge of Hebrew scripture was immense. They were well versed not only in scripture, but also in a vast library of the interpretations of scripture and the law. They knew to the letter what the prophets had said about the Messiah, and yet they were blind to Jesus' identity throughout. They were so immersed in the law that they couldn't allow themselves to contemplate a Messiah who was unlike themselves. We have at this point in Mark's Gospel story heard of Jesus healing an unknown number of people, and it won't be long until the Pharisees get wind of the two healings that happened on the Sabbath and their adherence to the law stands in the way not only of their compassion, but of their ability to recognise what's happening right in front of their eyes, and who, the, who is the cause of it. If Jesus casts out demons with just a word, what's that telling them about the per who this person is, and who has sent him? As Jesus goes on to later eat with sinners and forgive sin, the Pharisees cannot see beyond their outreach. The disciples in Mark's narrative are at times not seen in a good light. Their lack of understanding of who Jesus is and his purpose in ministry often eludes them. In today's reading, we heard of how they went to look for Jesus with the intention of bringing him back to the house. But that was not what Jesus had in mind. Jesus wanted to move on to other places to preach. That's why I've come, he told the disciples. It's still early days in Jesus' ministry, so the disciples can be forgiven for being unclear as to what Jesus is about. But throughout Mark's Gospel, we'll see evidence that at times they just didn't get him. Jesus was on a journey that they struggled to understand. They witness the miracles that Jesus performs. They see his compassion for the marginalised. They pick up the leftovers when he feeds 5,000 people with very little food. Mark tells us repeatedly that they were amazed by all Jesus did. But he also tells us that the disciples failed to understand because their hearts had been hardened. Even when Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah, his lack of understanding of what that actually means causes him to question what Jesus says must happen. And Jesus rebukes him, saying, Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So many educated people, so many close companions of Jesus, fail to see his true identity. And yet there are those who see through the veil. There are those who vocalise their convictions, and those whose actions speak louder than words. Whatever, we inter whatever way we interpret Mark's evil spirits and demons, there can be no doubt that Jesus was recognised when these healings took place although Jesus chose to silence them. When Jesus was in Bethany and visited Simon the leper, their meal was interrupted by an unnamed woman who anointed Jesus by pouring expensive oil on his head. Of course, some of those attending the meal were indignant. The oil was worth more than a year's wages. What had caused the woman to behave in this way? Mark tells us Jesus understood this action to be a pre-burial anointing. But what did the woman see in him that made her act as she did? What did she see in Jesus that caused her to behave with such extravagance when a mere few drops of this oil would have been sufficient? When Jesus was brought before Pilate, 
Mark again speaks of amazement. Now Pilate was amazed by Jesus' silence. However, although he found no fault in Jesus, Pilate too failed to recognise him, as did the soldiers who mocked and tormented Jesus. It was only as Jesus died that the centurion's eyes were opened and he declared, surely this man was the Son of God. It's striking that in Mark's Gospel, it's a woman with no name and a Roman centurion who recognised Jesus' identity. One by her actions and the other in his words. They are the ones who see through the mystery of Jesus and witness to those around them and to us. Let's face it, they are most unlikely models of faith. Yet there they are, along with those healed of what perhaps nowadays, with our greater understanding of psychology and psychiatry, may be recognised as some form of mental illness. In Mark's Gospel, Jesus went unrecognised by the religious authorities and, for the most part, his closest companions. A woman who, because of her gender, would not have been seen as a reliable witness in her time and culture. A Roman centurion who had been raised to worship pagan gods. And a number of people who had been cast out of society because illness was seen as being rooted in evil. These were the people, Mark tells us, who were privy to the knowledge that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. These were the people who were marginalised and maligned by the religious people of their day. We often say that Jesus turned the world upside down. And once again, we see the truth of that statement in Mark's Gospel. The question is, what will we do with these truths? How will this affect our ideas of who's welcome in the kingdom of God? How will it change our ideas and our actions in realising the mission of the church? Who do we tell about Jesus, who he is and why he came? How he's still changing lives today? Do we tell this to everyone we meet? Or just those people we think will get it? Are we leaving people outside of the fellowship of the church, our church, because they are different to us? They might not understand. They may have no knowledge yet of Christianity. They may be seen as lacking a place in society. If this is how our congregations are, then like the disciples in Mark's Gospel, our hearts are hardened and we do not yet know Christ. If this is how our church is, then like the Pharisees, we have not yet had our hearts open to the spirit of the law, the love of Jesus Christ. We need to ask for forgiveness and walk closer with him. As we continue on our journey with Jesus in Mark's Gospel, let's keep our hearts and minds open to who Jesus is, why he came, and his instruction to his followers at the end of Mark's good news. Go out into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Amen. Let's sing hymn number 361. Forgiveness is your gift, both cleansing and renewing.
Let us pray. Gracious and all-loving God, we thank you for the gift of love you give us. Thank you for the wonderful example of your love which we find in Christ Jesus our Lord. He came into our world to teach us how to live, but not everyone welcomed him or recognised him. Sadly, that is still so today. Send your spirit among us, O God, and in the days of this week, inspire us to see Jesus in the faces of those whom we meet. Help us to reach out in love to all, and especially those who are in need, those on the margins, living on the edge. We pray for all who have not yet heard Jesus' name, and for those who have heard it but turned away. May we work to bring them to you, so that they too may know the wonders of your love. Lord Jesus Christ, healer and friend, we ask for your healing, for all who are ill in body, mind or spirit. Reach out and touch those who wait for surgery. Encourage those who are recuperating. Comfort all affected by COVID-19. Guard our hospital staff from succumbing or being overwhelmed by this disease. Strengthen those who are manufacturing, distributing and administering the vaccines, that the programme may be rolled out quickly and efficiently, but not just here in the UK, worldwide. Loving Lord, may those who are approaching death know that you are there to receive them on their final journey. And may those left behind know the comfort of your love. Holy God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, one God forever, hear the prayers of your people, for we ask them in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Well, once again, thank you for joining us in worship today, and we hope that you'll join us again next time. Our closing hymn is hymn number 458, At the Name of Jesus, Every Knee Shall Bow.
let us go back into our communities, imitating all we have learned in Christ Jesus. Let's go now to love God and serve God's people, to serve God and to love God's people. And as we go, may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be the light that descends upon us and remains with us now and forever. Amen.